Welcome to session three of the Paleontological Research Institution's 14th Annual Summer Symposium. Um, if this is your first time joining us today, a little background about our event. Uh, due to developments across our country and the world, we as a group of Cornell graduate students and early career professionals felt the need to dedicate our theme this year to diversity, equity, and inclusion in paleontology. We hope the presentations and Q&A panels today will foster meaningful conversation and help invoke change in our fields. Um, so welcome to the third and final session of today's program. Um, my name is Jaylee um, and I will be your moderator for this session. Um, there's also a whole team of us, um, most are behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smoothly today. Um, this session will be recorded uh, for later viewing um, and unless otherwise noted by our speakers, uh, please do not record or take screenshots of presentations um, unless the speaker uh, says that you have permission to do so. Um, so I want to thank all of our speakers and attendees uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, each presenter will present for 20 minutes, followed by uh, time for a few questions. Um, and then at the end of the session, we will have a 30 minute live Q&A panel with all of our speakers from this session. Uh, please direct your speaker questions to the Q&A chat feature found at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have questions for a specific panelist, please note that uh, in your question. Um, and they will be asked by one of the session moderators. Uh, please bear with us as we navigate this virtual format um, and any technical difficulties that we may encounter during this session. If Zoom happens to crash for any reason, uh, please just rejoin the webinar with your webinar link and we will get things back up and running as soon as possible. Uh, so we hope you, you enjoy the session. Um, and let's transition to our first speaker slide. I would like to introduce Dr. Kuheli Dutt, who is an Assistant Director of uh, Academic Affairs and Diversity at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. And she will be presenting a talk on promoting racial diversity in the geosciences. So take it away, Kuheli. Thank you so much, Jaylee. Um, is it okay if I share my screen now? Absolutely. Good afternoon and thank you for attending today's session. Uh, my talk is about promoting racial diversity in the geosciences. Um, as you know, the geosciences are among the least diverse STEM fields and we haven't had any change in racial, racial diversity in the last 40 years. On top of that, underrepresented minorities account for only about 5% of the PhDs in the geosciences and hold less than 4% of the faculty positions at, top, at the top 100 geoscience institutions. Like academia and other STEM fields in the geosciences, the leadership is almost entirely white and mostly male. And so we have this lack of an inclusive culture in the geosciences where you have these dominant groups of white, male, cisgender, heterosexual people, and that is the dominant culture of the geosciences. One of the issues is, I mean, we've been talking about in response to recent events, talking about race and racism and systemic racism, but in order to address it, we have to first acknowledge that it exists. And I find that that's the first stumbling block for many people and institutions, the reluctance to acknowledge that there is a problem. Take a look at the geosciences, the purple arrow, that's the geosciences. And this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, this is from the Bernard and Cooper doc paper that showed there was no change in racial diversity in the last 40 years. Again, this is no surprise to anyone. And in STEM fields, I'm going to mention a few studies that were done all specifically to STEM fields. So one of them found that Black and Latinx undergrads had the same likelihood as white undergrads to pursue STEM majors, but they ended up leaving at higher rates despite similar academic preparation and background. Another study found that LGBTQ students left STEM at higher rates than cisgender straight students. Yet another study found that women of color experienced the highest levels of harassment in STEM fields. And yet another study found 
that almost 50% of Black and Latina scientists who had been surveyed had been mistaken as janitors at administrative staff. So when you take all this together, what does this highlight? When, ev when anyone and everyone who's not part of the dominant culture ends up leaving or leaving at a higher rate, you have to acknowledge that there is a fundamental problem with the culture of that field. And a lot of this, the exclusionary culture, is rooted deeply in implicit bias and stereotype threat, and that's what a lot of my research is based on. Um, there's, and these are just highlights of certain studies. There are dozens more. Women and people of color, in particular African Americans or people who identify as Black, are often stereotyped as not having innate brilliance. So there was one particular study that looked at, I think, 14 million um, evaluations on Rate My Professor and found that women and African Americans were least likely to be described as brilliant. Another study said that it didn't really matter whether it was a STEM field or a non-STEM field. Any field where there is a perception that you need raw innate talent and brilliance are the fields where women and people of color, particularly Blacks, are underrepresented because they're perceived as not having that talent. So whether you're talking about geosciences or physics or STEM fields, or even philosophy or classics. It's, it's the same idea. You've probably all heard of this particular study, the lab manager position for um, you know, this job application, where there were identical CVs and they gave one of them a male name, I think it was John, and the other one a female name, Jennifer. And they found that the CVs that had got the male name had been rated much higher than the identical uh, female uh, applicants. Similar to race, they did another study, I think with thousands of CVs, and they found that the CVs that had been given Western sounding names like Emily and Greg got 50% higher callbacks for interviews compared to the identical CVs with, with ethnic sounding names like Lakeisha and Jamal. NIH recently released a study, and I think about seven or eight years ago, they released another one, but the result is the same. Black scientists and women in particular receive less funding than similarly qualified white scientists or men. There was another study where they did this fictitious thing where they made up a whole bunch of fake student names and student profiles, and they wrote to these prospective, uh, wrote to faculty members pretending to be prospective students who were interested in a research opportunity with that professor. And what they found is that if the applicant, the fake applicant was profile was that of a white male, they were much more likely to get a response from the professor. So the consistent messaging for all of these studies is that people of color, that women are of lesser value. And when you have a culture that is built on that consistent messaging, of course, diversity is going to be a problem. Here's an example of a stereotype threat. And I find this particular example fascinating for a few different reasons. Uh, this is Brent Staples. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Um, he was a graduate student in Chicago's Hyde Park in the 1970s. And he noticed that when he walked on the streets, people avoided him, white people avoided him. They, they, they felt very, they were clearly scared of him. They were threatened by him. They crossed the street. They didn't want to talk to him. They clutched their purses tighter or reached for each other's hands. And even when he tried to do things like wish them good evening or good morning or say hello or smile at them, it didn't make any difference. He realized it was to do with the perception of a black male in Chicago in the 1970s. And so what he started doing was that he started whistling tunes from classical music as he walked down the street. And he noticed immediately that suddenly people weren't afraid of him anymore. And so what he did over here is he removed himself from the negative stereotype of black men in that area. What is really going on here, if you dissect all the pieces, there's the microaggression piece where clearly the white people have a ne you know, are not comfortable with a black person and they make it clear they're not comfortable with that black person. There's a stereotype threat, that is they already have a negative association of a black man. And, the, and then finally, white comfort, that is Brent Staples had to change his behavior. Had, he had to change the way he presented himself so that the white people around him felt comfortable. Now, every one of these pieces, microaggression, stereotype threat, white comfort, this is what a lot of STEM fields, academia, geosciences are built on. 
Affinity bias is another very powerful bias, but unlike the other biases which suggest doing harm to someone or perceiving someone negatively, affinity bias is about liking people who are just like ourselves. In other words, we see the most value in people who do work like us, or we most closely associate with people who look like us or share a background with us. So this affinity bias is a reason why in the in the geosciences or in STEM fields in general, the leadership doesn't really change because people tend to appoint others who look like themselves or do work like themselves. Now, this is something very powerful, affinity bias. Studies have found that babies as young as six months old show a preference for people of their own race. And affinity bias is not so much about who we harm as it's who we try to help. It could be based on race, it could be based on affiliation, say people from Ivy Leagues looking down on community colleges or a certain type of work that someone does. It could be gender, it could be uh, sexual orientation, any of those things. And that's why this combination of affinity bias with systemic racism is what contributes to the mostly white leadership in the geosciences. Now, I know that someone spoke earlier about intersectionality, and I think someone is also going to speak about it, so I'll keep this really short. This phrase was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a professor uh, at Columbia and also UCLA, and she was on the original uh, legal team defending Anita Hill. This phrase, what, it, what this term, what it means actually, is that people with multiple marginalized identities tend to be the most disadvantaged within society. What does this mean? This means even within a marginalized group, there's a hierarchy. So the feminist movement mostly benefited white women rather than women of color. Similarly, the LGBTQ movement mostly benefited people who are, white people who identified as gay or lesbian, specifically white cisgender people who identify as gay or lesbian. So you have very different realities for, say, a, a cisgender, gender conforming, white gay man versus a black transgender woman. So that's what intersectionality means, that the more marginalized identities you have, the more disadvantaged you are. So the combined effect of all of these things, implicit bias, stereotype threat, affinity bias, intersectionality, lack of equal access to opportunity and, uh, and resources, is why the STEM fields are so uh, lacking in diversity. And what ends up happening in a situation like this is that you have the dominant groups over here in the specific instant, white, male, cisgender, straight, controlling the outcomes for minority groups, even though they have very different lived realities and don't always even have a very deep understanding of the problem. So there was a study with the Pew Center that the Pew Center did that found that white people are far less likely to believe or acknowledge racial in inequity compared to black people. Another study found that male faculty in STEM tended to be more skeptical of gender bias evidence than others. And the reason I mentioned these two points, it shows that people who don't necessarily experience a certain challenge themselves end up dominating the lens, the perspective, and the outcomes for those who actually do face and experience those challenges. One example I like to give is the US College President's survey. Now, when they were asked, you know, what, what they thought about race relations on US colleges, uh, college campuses in general. Only 25% of them said that race relations on college campuses were in general good. But when they were asked about race relations on their own campus, 81% of them said that it was good. Good or excellent. So what happens here is that even though in some instances people might acknowledge there's a problem, there's a reluctance to believe that the problem lies with them or their institution. It's like the problem is elsewhere, not with us. And, and, and given that the university leadership is almost entirely white, it means people in power have a very limited understanding of the race relation, of racial issues. Compound that, that's compounded with the fact that most DEI work is often carried out by people of color themselves. So in the geosciences, we have this, we have three problems occurring simultaneously. One is that you have a very low number of PhDs in the geosciences, and so there is a pipeline problem. Two, you have a complete absence of underrepresented minority role models for students or junior people to look up to. And three, 
the culture in the geosciences, like other STEM fields, is highly exclusionary and favors dominant groups rather than marginalized groups. And if we truly want to make a difference in the geosciences, we need to address all three of these simultaneously. Now, there have been various studies on uh, URM students in geoscience, and various factors have been identified, sense of belonging, math preparation, faculty as role models, self-confidence, positive experiences, <clears throat> social persuasion, and basic things like knowledge of the college application process and the knowledge of income prospects from the geosciences. And these factors combine, it isn't any one of them that's more important than others, but these work together to keep certain groups underrepresented. And so if we want to improve the geosciences, we need to systematically address every single one of these factors. And to promote racial diversity, we need to acknowledge that racism is in fact real. So <clears throat> we have racism, which is a systemic advantage based on race, which is different from prejudice. Prejudice is something that anyone can have regardless of their race. I mean, people of all races can hold prejudice. Whereas when we talk about racism, we're talking about a systemic advantage that some groups have. And the main difference between these two is power differential. And what this means is that while, while everyone, say whether it's white people and people of color might all hold individual prejudices, white people are in a position to act on those prejudices in a way that harm people of color, whereas people of color are not in a position to act in a way that harm white people. I'm talking collectively about the system, the institution. That is the key difference. It's an acknowledgement of this power differential and this different lived reality and systemic advantage. It's difficult to talk about this because there is a tendency for white people to not view themselves in racialized terms. And there is this notion, oh, if you work hard, you'll do well, without acknowledging the fact that race also played a role in why someone did well and why someone else didn't. The notion of whiteness itself is a very sensitive topic because over time, Italians, Irish, Jewish people, Greek, they all quote unquote became white. And every one of these groups has known marginalization at some point or the other. And in Hispanic and Latinx cultures, this is significantly more nuanced and complex. It's much more than being black or white because a lot of people have indigenous and mixed ancestry, but it's also things to do with colorism where lighter skin is, more, is, be, is associated with a higher social status, a higher preference, and the richer schools and neighborhoods also tend to be the ones that are dominated with lighter skinned or white passing people. So it is a very sensitive subject and unless we choose to delve into it and address it, we're not gonna be able to move very far. And the key thing to keep in mind, and I say this in all of my talks, is that you can still have white privilege while facing challenges or oppression in some other identity. So just because you have white privilege doesn't mean that you don't have any other problems or that you have some luxury or, you know, or that you don't face challenges. It's just that for race, you're, you, know, you don't have that particular challenge that people of color have. Now this needs to be addressed on two different levels. One is the individual level and one is the institutional or departmental level. At the individual level, um, I ask everyone to do a reality check. Now I've been the diversity officer for Lamont for I would say almost 12 years now, you know, at least 11 years now. And I've almost never met someone who didn't self-identify as a supporter of diversity and inclusion. So I ask everyone to do a reality check with themselves and say, what have you actually done? Other than self-identifying as a supporter of diversity and inclusion, what have you actually done to promote racial diversity in the geosciences. And this is really important because I don't know if any of you have read this book by Eduardo Bonilla Silva called Racism Without Racists. In there, he talks about the study when a lot of white people were asked whether they would invite people of, whether they had a problem inviting people of color or a black person to their house for dinner. Almost everyone said, no, of course not. You know, we'd be happy to invite a person of color or a black person home for dinner. But when they were asked if they had actually done it, more than 80% of them did not have any close friends or you know, associates who were people of color. So this, it's, this, it's this difference that needs to be looked into. 
Another thing I tell people to do, this is the equivalent, you know, the racial version or the race version of a panel. When someone invites you to be on a panel, ask for the panel composition, ask how many people of color are on it and ask what efforts were made to invite people of color. Now in the field of geosciences, it is of course difficult. There isn't that much of a pool anyway, but it just means that organizers should make that much extra of an effort. Institutions should make that much extra of an effort to be proactive and invite people of color. It's also important to separate systemic racism from the advantage rather than view it as a character defect because there's a tendency to view it as a character defect. The other thing I would encourage everyone to do is to please do your homework because it is not the duty of a person of color to educate white people on the subject of racism, though very often that's what ends up happening. At the departmental level, I, you know, one of the things you can immediately do is invest in pipeline programs. Of course, going through carefully all of the points that had been mentioned earlier of what's important in a pipeline program. Make sure you have a diversity advocate on a search committee because merit is a highly subjective concept. I mean, people mistakenly believe it's an objective concept, but merit is heavily based on affinity bias. We see the most merit, the most value in people who do work just like us or do work that we consider valuable. In other words, it is a very subjective concept. Be proactive and aggressively appoint faculty and scientists of color to leadership roles because that's the only way you're gonna have role models that is, that's gonna make, that's gonna set the tone that students of color and postdocs of color are welcome. Revise your curriculum in whatever way you can to acknowledge the work of scholars of color and by the way, this is not even just about the geosciences. I mean, I recently gave a talk at, uh, at a school of architecture and I was astounded by the similarities in some of the problems. Again, invite speakers of color and there needs to be very real acknowledgement of DEI work. Like I said, it's usually borne by marginalized groups. One thing that you could do at an institutional level is to revise your promotion criteria in some way to include DEI work because currently most promotion criteria involve uh, you know, um, grades, uh, classes taught, you know, lectures, uh, uh, lectures given, student evaluations, publications, grant proposals, and so on. And of course those are important, but unless you add DEI work to it, you're consistently setting back people of color because they are devoting time and effort to addressing this problem. Again, wherever possible, compensate people for doing this DEI work because they're taking this time out of their schedule when they could be writing a proposal or doing other work. They're taking time out to do this to benefit the institution and to benefit white colleagues. I'll very quickly, I'm mindful of the time. I think I have very little time left. So I'm just gonna very quickly run through some examples. Yes, Jaylee, I see you. Very uh, uh, examples of things that we've done at Lamont. Um, one, this is just a snapshot and I'm just going to go through two or three of these, but the idea is we have a multi-pronged approach. So we revised our search and hiring processes completely from, you know, including guidelines on implicit bias, posting in diverse venues, comparing our applicant pool with the national available pool that NSF provides data on, and then providing a search committee report that explains not only why the top candidate was selected, but why the other people on the shortlist were not selected. What we found is that there was a significant increase in women scientists across our ranks, result of concerted efforts. Mostly this was most striking at the junior level where it's now about 50% women. But where it came to race, we hardly saw any change. It was little to no change. And we realized part of it is to do with the fact that only about 5% of the PhDs go to underrepresented minorities. And so we need to invest in pipeline programs. And one of our programs is called the Secondary School Field Research Program, which is predominantly underrepresented minority students. And this is an immersive summer program. So these kids, they do field work, they analyze samples, they write research reports, and then they make a presentation. And they're treated like early career scientists. This is a highly successful program. All of the students go on to college and about 50% go on to STEM majors, including receiving scholarships. So this is one of the pictures in the field. 
Now on the top right corner, you'll see a picture of this white man and he is the program director of this program. And the reason I always like to highlight this is that if we really want to change in culture, people from dominant groups need to take ownership of this problem rather than view it as someone else's problem and then self-identify as being a supporter. So taking ownership is key. Um, this is nothing specific or LGBTQ awareness. This is nothing specific to race, but in general, promoting cultures of inclusivity. Those of you who've been to the Lamont campus will see these little stickers all over campus saying you are welcome here. But also this year, you know, the pride social activities that we had, we actually, some of our students and postdocs spoke about the Stonewall riots specifically in the context of police brutality towards marginalized groups. And so these conversations create an inclusive space. We have a diversity seminar, uh, which we usually do maybe one or two times a year to invite people to talk about diversity. At the same time, we try to get more diverse speakers in our regular scientific seminars. We broaden the scope of our mentoring award uh, to include non-traditional, earlier it was just traditional faculty, PI, student kind of mentoring. We included summer mentoring, underrepresented minority mentoring, technical lab mentoring, broadening up who can write letters of recommendation. And we saw a dramatic difference going from like 14% recipients female to about 50%. We have this event called Harassment Awareness Month that is just a whole series of events. We do it typically in March every year that just promotes awareness and the importance of these topics. And just recent efforts have been, you know, we've done racial sensitivity workshops. We've had conversations about camp across campus town halls. Our new director has just, uh, she just uh, implemented, uh, appointed a new task force. And our students and postdocs came up with anti-racism resources. We also on a monthly basis discuss racism and anti-racism issues at Lamont. So this is just a nutshell. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying that if we truly wanna promote diversity, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. You can't just handle one thing. You have to handle multiple things together. Uh, most important, I would say the mo three most critical things are pipeline, role models, and geoscience culture. Remember, you cannot have diversity without inclusion. You cannot have inclusion unless people feel like they belong. And you cannot have people feel, people will not feel like they belong unless their identity is acknowledged. And DEI work needs to, it's something you need to always work on. It needs to always be on the radar. Just like as a scientist, you don't just write one publication and say, oh, I'm good. I did that one thing, check the box, I'm done. No, doing your science is an ongoing endeavor. It's the same with DEI work, it is ongoing. And most critically, the leadership needs to take ownership of the problem because otherwise what ends up happening is students, postdoc, faculty of color, end up bearing, or marginalized groups, LGBTQ, women, people of color, bear the entire brunt of the problem. I think that's it. Thank you. I will stop the share right now. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we have time uh, for at least one question. Um, so let's see. So this question is from Julie. Uh, so to diversify the geosciences, we need to attract more diverse people into geoscience majors. Uh, to attract more diverse geoscience majors, we could target secondary teachers to help encourage students to major in geoscience, but we lack geoscience and also diverse teachers. How can the geoscience field work with teacher preparation to lead to more diversity? That's something, so uh, I think one of, that, that, that's a great question actually, because exposure to the geosciences or lack of exposure to the geosciences happens, to, is often a limiting factor. I would encourage all institutions to aggressively focus on education and outreach efforts. So for example, we have at Lamont education and outreach efforts at the K-12 level, because that's the level at which we would work with teachers, with work with students, and introduce them to the geosciences so that by the time they're ready to go to college, they know what the geosciences are and have some sort of context. So yeah, I mean, investing in education and outreach efforts, specifically at the K-12 level, is, is very important. And again, it has to be done at an institutional level where the dean or the director or the chair uh, invests, makes a commitment to doing this. 
All right, and here's one more question. Uh, for those of us in departments or institutions who are just beginning to address DEI issues, do you have any recommendations about building buy-in from those in dominant groups? <laughs> well, well, let's put it this way. One of the most common questions I get from students and postdocs when I do workshops and, and seminars is, how do we get the people in the room who really need to be there? Because very often it's the people who are already sensitive and aware of these issues who show up and ones who think that they don't need to be there, who, you know, who really need to be there, who don't. And again, this is again, very important for the leadership. The leadership needs to send a message. The leadership needs to not request, but tell faculty members, you need to be there. This session is happening. You need to be there. Or this is a particular initiative. I'm going to be there. You should be there too. And I think part of it is getting these people in the room is the first step. And once that happens, engaging them in the conversation is the next. And so I would encourage you very strongly to reach directly out to your leadership and say, you know, can you please set the example so that senior faculty follow you? Awesome, thank you. And if it's all right with you, I, uh, we have one more question, which a lot of people are suggesting gets asked. Uh, so if we want to get involved with DEI work at higher levels in our organizations, but we get blocked because of career hierarchy, how do we influence the gatekeepers to let us contribute? Yeah, I mean, at the risk of repeating myself, I think leadership is really key. And so it's, I think the first step you need to do is try to make the leadership aware. And it could be daunting for one person to do it because they're worried about retaliation or something, you know, something going wrong or you know, potential punishment. What I do encourage is as a cohort do it. So if, if say you're all assistant faculty, say assistant professors, have the entire group of assistant professors request the faculty leadership for a meeting and say, we wanna talk about this. And here is our list of discussion points. What can we do? I mean, if it was one person, that person could bear, you know, face a backlash. But if it's the entire rank of assistant professors, what are they going to do? Fire the entire department? And so that's the first step you need to take. You know, as an entire cohort, reach out to the leadership to make sure there's that you create space to have these conversations. And like I said, it can't be a one-time thing. It has to be, you know, sustained. So. Maybe if you make a commitment that once every semester, this entire group, whether it's assistant professors, whether it's associate professors, is going to reach out, is going to schedule a meeting with the department chair or the, you know, or the leadership and say, you know, this is what we want money for. These are the things we want to do. How are you going to help us to do it? That has to be a commitment from a group. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Dutt. Uh, we are going to be uh, moving on to our next presentation. Uh, if uh, a question uh, that you put in the Q&A did not quite get answered, we will get back to them uh, at the end of session three during our live Q&A panel. Um, so moving on to our next presentation, um, we have Dr. Patricia Kelly, who unfortunately could not be with us today. Um, so. Dr. Patricia Kelly is a professor emerita at the Department of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She is also a research associate at the Paleontological Research Institution. Thanks to the organizers of this timely symposium for inviting me to speak and for allowing me to work around a previous commitment by recording my presentation. Today I'm going to be talking about my life experiences as a woman in a field that was not always welcoming, what I learned from those experiences, and a broad range of suggestions for how to make our field more inclusive, diverse, and equitable. At the College of Worcester, where I was an undergraduate, there were a lot of female geology majors. I didn't realize that there was anything unusual about being a woman paleontologist. Then I started grad school at Harvard. It wasn't until I was on a class field trip that I looked around and realized I was the only woman out of about a dozen students. I thought to myself, I guess that's the way things are and I stopped drinking water so I wouldn't have to make a fuss about finding a bathroom. 
At Harvard, I was given my own office, which surprised me as the men had desks among the collections or in a large bullpen. Then I walked into the men's bullpen and noticed the pornographic posters and the rare book collection, mainly Playboy magazines, and I thought to myself, guess that's the way things are. Eventually, I was told that if I managed to get a PhD, I would only be the second woman to do so in invertebrate paleontology. I thought to myself, I guess that's the way things are. I didn't really doubt that I could finish my degree, even though not everyone on my committee thought that women, and especially I, belonged in paleontology. I wasn't one of the guys. I didn't participate in the Friday afternoon beer drinking fests in the rare book room. But I had the protect protection of Steve Gould, even though I was wrong the wrong religion, married to a Presbyterian minister to be, no less, and I followed the wrong baseball team, Cleveland, not the Yankees, Steve made sure that there were no barriers to my getting through. I finished my degree in four years and accepted a job at the University of Mississippi in the geology and geological engineering department. I moved in and looked around the engineering complex for a bathroom labeled faculty women to match the faculty men's room. But of course, there was none because I was the first and only woman faculty member in the School of Engineering. I guess that's the way things are, I thought to myself when sharing the ladies room with the secretaries and the few female engineering students. I was realizing more and more that I was an oddity as a woman paleontologist among male engineers. And then we decided to start a family and there were new challenges. When I told my department colleagues that I was pregnant, one of them groaned, I guess I'll have to go back to teaching paleontology. In shock, I realized that they thought motherhood was going to end my career. I guess that's the way things are, I thought to myself and vowed to prove them wrong. And I did. 10 years and two children later, I was a full professor, associate dean, and named the outstanding faculty member in the School of Engineering. I'd even gotten an NSF grant from the Research Opportunities for Women program. I'd started making my way professionally. I loved going to GSA because that was the only place that I could see other paleontologists. I wasn't in the inner circle. I'd see Steve Gould going out with his male colleagues and former students, and I wasn't included. And GSA was not exactly a welcoming place for women. I remember a talk by a prominent paleontologist in which an irrelevant slide of a naked woman appeared. I guess that's the way things are, I wondered. But I made my own colleagues, mostly male, and began to assume more positions of leadership in the profession. After two years as the geology and paleontology program director at NSF, I moved on to the University of North Dakota. I was still the only woman in the School of Engineering. I guess that's the way things are, I thought. But now as department chair, I had some clout and so did paleontology as the centerpiece of the building. And I was feeling like less of an imposter. After five years, I traded in blizzards and floods for hurricanes and floods and moved to University of North Carolina, Wilmington for the second half of my career. I was department chair again, but this time in a department of geography and geology. There were other women faculty in the department who had been hired shortly before me. And so I had the opportunity to mentor them, nominate them for awards, hire more women, and in general, make it easier for faculty, male and female, to balance parental and teaching schedules. I was finally getting to change the way things are.
I feel very fortunate in my career. I did more things than I ever expected to do back when I was just trying to survive in a male-dominated world. I was pre president of the Paleo Society, the fourth woman in 100 years, and president of the PRI Board of Trustees. My research and teaching were recognized at my universities and at the national level, including the Association for Women Geoscientists Outstanding Educator Award and the Carnegie Foundation Case United States Professor of the Year Award. I'm very grateful to the family, friends, colleagues, and students who have supported me along the way. I realize now how lucky I was, and it makes me want to try to enable the success of others. I focused mostly on women because my personal battle was based on gender. And unfortunately, things haven't improved that much for women. Only a quarter of geoscientists are women, and women with geoscience degrees are almost twice as likely not to be working in science and engineering than men. The situation is even worse in cases of intersectionality, where women of color have much higher unemployment rates. And all women are more likely to not be working due to family than are men. Paleontology is similar among faculty. About a quarter are women. Across all jobs, a third are women of those responding to a Paleo Society poll of members. Of those responding, a much smaller percentage are LGBTQ and of a race ethnicity other than white, with Black slash African Americans representing only 2%. So how do we change the way things are? I'll address three areas, recruitment into the pipeline, starting at K-12, retention in the pipeline, and changing the culture so that we don't have to look like white males to succeed. Paleo and geosciences suffer from recruitment issues. The subjects are not taught in high school and are not seen as lucrative fields, so K through 12 recruitment is essential. One shot events can be helpful, for instance, classroom visits, interacting at science fairs, putting on programs for scout troops, but prolonged interactions involving longer term one on one mentoring make a bigger difference. For instance, supervising a high school capstone project or participating regularly in after school programs or summer science camps. For example, Tor Hansen and I were PIs on the NSF funded Moon Snail Project in which we involved teachers and students from 14 coastal minority serving middle schools around the country in our research on drilling predation by natissive gastropods. Students and teachers did field work, collected data, and tested hypotheses on geographic variation in predation. Students were excited about doing real science and could see themselves in science careers. I suspect that students with these experiences are more likely to find their way into introductory geology classes, which are the major source of recruitment for geology programs. For instance, two thirds of Association for Women Geoscientists members cite an intro course or teacher as their primary influence in becoming geoscientists. So what can be done to attract majors from underrepresented groups? The way we teach is important. For one thing, I recommend greater use of open educational resources, OER. Instead of using expensive textbooks that mostly draw examples of geoscientists from white male populations, use openly licensed materials, for example, from the public domain, Creative Commons, OER Commons, etc. 
OER can be revised, reused, remixed, retained, and redistributed without requesting permission from the creator. They are available from the first day of class at no cost to students. They can be adapted to match the identities and experiences of students, allowing use of examples from underrepresented groups. Underrepresented students can see themselves in careers as geoscientists and paleontologists. OER can be adapted for accessibility, and they are sustainable in the sense that they can easily be kept current. Right now, geology materials are limited at sites such as OER Commons. We need to create more. Open pedagogy predates open licensing but also takes open licensing to the next level. Emphasis is on giving students a voice such, as they, such that they are creators and not just consumers of knowledge. Rather than using disposable assignments that are never seen again once they're graded, assignments are renewable. Student products contribute to the community of knowledge for example, as open, openly licensed Wikipedia articles, or as presentations or publications in scientific venues. For instance, this paper is based on the senior thesis of the first author, and four of the co-authors were also undergrads. Diverse students are empowered through this process. We should also avoid practices that will discourage underrepresented groups from continuing in the geosciences. Subtle things like calling on white males more or paying more attention to their questions and comments in class. Pipeline leaks occur at each stage of education. We lose diverse students between bachelor's and master's and between master's and PhD degrees. So how do we prevent these pipeline leaks? Again, by allowing members of underrepresented groups to envision themselves in the field by increasing visibility of underrepresented scientists and providing role models, which incidentally are goals of PRI's Daring to Dig project and of the Bearded Lady project. By involving students in groups such as the Association for Women Geoscientists, which has local chapters, the Society for Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science, and the National Association of Black Geoscientists. And working closely with individual students to mentor them and to provide opportunities to do genuine science, e.g. through research experiences for undergraduates and similar programs. If we use open pedagogy and involve students in creating knowledge, students will realize their potential to contribute to a field. The results are empowering. For example, the REU program led by Greg Deedle and me with the able assistance of UNCW graduate students, including Christy Visaggi, who's speaking later in this session, had a high success rate in that 85% of our diverse group of participants went on to careers and or additional study in the sciences. Notably, all six Latinx students completed advanced degrees. Finally, the transition to the workplace. Gender bias still occurs in hiring, with studies indicating that faculty see male students as more competent hireable, and worth mentoring. In academia, there may be bias in salaries and startup, and women often bear the brunt of trailing spouse and childcare issues. This point has been driven home recently by studies indicating that the ongoing pandemic is differentially affecting research productivity of women, for instance, submission of manuscripts, who are spending more time on childcare and homeschooling than men. Workplace bias still exists. At an institutional level, personnel policies like stopping the tenure clock and family leave, which didn't exist in my day, can help, although those who take advantage of them can sometimes be stigmatized. 
creating a family friendly culture with on site daycare and flexible schedules can benefit parents regardless of gender. Workload assignments also need to be reconsidered. Women often carry heavier service loads, as do persons of color, especially when institutions attempt to increase diversity and inclusion. And especially now, when institutions are actively seeking ways to combat racism with task forces, workshops, etc., we cannot expect Black, Indigenous, and people of color to carry the burden of educating white colleagues about racism. Those of us who re represent white privilege need to do the hard work ourselves. Another gender bias exists in the area of scholarship. Females in STEM fields publish less, review less, receive worse reviews, and are perceived to contribute less than their male colleagues. In paleontology, women recipients of research-based awards from the Paleontological Society have been scarce. 7% of PS medalists, 14% of Schubert awardees. We need to change the culture of implicit bias that exists against those who are not white males. Bias that includes weaker reference letters, negative evaluations, less mentoring, and access to leaders. The culture can be changed through such steps as implicit bias training, blind evaluations, and mentoring and networking opportunities. This is an area where our professional societies, like the Association for Women Geoscientists, or the Paleontological Society, can make a difference. And finally, Members of underrepresented groups, women, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, and LGBTQ individuals have been selected, subjected to harassment, bullying, and assault. Steps are being taken in the right direction, with ethics statements and codes of conduct being established by professional societies and for this meeting and training opportunities being offered, for instance, by AWG. We also need policies of no recrimination when violations are reported, zero tolerance policies, and penalties for offenders. Codes aren't useful unless they are enforced. Don't be like me. Don't assume that's the way things are, that things would be different if we had a beard or a different color of skin or sexual preference. It's time to change the way things are as individuals and as a community. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in to Dr. Patricia Kelly's presentation. Um, we will be entering a short break before our next presentation at 5.05 .05 Eastern Time, so five minutes after the hour. I have three short um, reminders for everyone before we take a quick break, and I recommend everyone takes uh, the time to get up and stretch. We have two more presentations in session three. Um, so my first reminder is, uh, if you are able, uh, our speakers have recommended uh, several funds and organizations to donate to in lieu of registration fee for this uh, symposium. Uh, you can find those on our PRI symposium webpage. Um, two is please, if you have attended any of our sessions today, uh, we are really looking forward to um, your feedback for how a uh, symposium went this year. Uh, so if you could take a few moments to give us some feedback, we would truly appreciate it. And three, um, please, if you have any questions so far, um, don't forget to put them in our Q&A. You can find that at the bottom of your screen and we will revisit those during our live panel Q&A at the end of session three. All right, everyone, see you soon um, for our next talk at 5.05. Next up, 
we um, have Dr. Anne-Marie Nunez, who is professor in the Department of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. And she will be uh, presenting her talk titled Toward Intersectional Equity in the Geosciences. So Dr. Nunez, please feel free to share your screen and start your presentation. So I just wanted to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to be here, to uh, be part of this community. Um, and when I saw who was presenting before me, I realized that I could start my talk in a very different place <laughs> than I would otherwise. So um, what I'm hoping is that what I talk about will um, provide a lens for thinking about change in geoscience um, that complements what has been discussed today and goes more deeply into the term intersectionality um, and, and what intersectional means. So um, what brought me to this work, a lot of my earlier research, I focused on the trajectories of first generation college going students, Latinx students, English learner students, and um, in many of those cases, I was among the first researcher to be doing, uh, conducting scholarship in that area and from a quantitative perspective initially. And one of the things that I then delved into deeper was the diversity within each of these groups. How are they defined, right? Um, and so, so that was one of, uh, one of the issues that led me to this work. A second is that as Dr. Du um, so elegantly put it, identity is really complex, right? Um, race and the way that it's constructed is very uh, complex. Uh, and another issue is that when I was doing uh, work, doing field work on geosciences, so all of this work led me to broadening participation work in science, um, I realized that that when I was uh, talking with students from underrepresented groups, they didn't always necessarily identify in that way. Um, and so that, you know, what, which, which identity was salient to them? Um, a woman of color might not have, you know, been thinking of herself as Latinx or, um, and so um, in other, and I'll get to that in a moment, but. Okay, I want to acknowledge, um, the National Science Foundation funding um, that made this possible. And um, I'm going to circle back, but these are have been my thought partners over the years in this work, um, co-principal investigators. A lot of this talk is going to be based on an article that I recently published in the journal Geosciences Education with two graduate students who I'm proud to say um, a Latinx student and a Native American student. Um, and so, uh, intersectionality has been referenced so far today. Um, this is um, the work of sociologist Patricia Hill Collins um, and talking about how, you know, the, the idea of multiple identities and how they constitute complex social inequalities and need to be looked at together. Um, and that intersectionality is not only um, a a theory. It also can be employed as a form of critical praxis. And a lot of times in my field of education and also in the sciences, when people talk about intersectionality, they're just talking about it on the individual level. Like they just disaggregate within, you know, they'll disaggregate race within gender if they're presenting quantitative results, right? Um, and, and that kind of work is really important and really insightful. But the original meaning of intersectionality was really grounded in activism and resistance against racism, um, you know, beginning in the work of Surgeon of Truth to all the way to now, to Black Lives Matter. Um, so this term um, has been traveled. It's what people talk about as intellectual travel, right? And so here I'm talking about it traveling to the geoscience, but it's important to understand the roots of it, that it's, um, you know, grounded in Black feminist thought, in legal studies, um, we have heard uh, these authors cited earlier today. Um, a lot, but what the critics uh, who employ this framework have talked about is that it's often been just used more as a research uh, framework or to focus on individuals as opposed to transforming structures that need to be transformed. And so um, I drew on the work of um, 
sociologist Floya Anthias to develop a structural multidimensional model of intersectionality that not only looks at you know, the importance of multiple identities, but how they interplay with institutions to perpetuate inequities um, in the sciences and other fields. Um, and so here, um, you know, I've given examples, and I'm going to be, you know, talking more about this, but just looking at how systems of power are interlocking, how they re reinforce and perpetuate inequities, and we've talked about incentive structures, for example, you know, as they intersect with disciplines. I mean, if somebody's supposed to become well known nationally or internationally in their discipline, how does that work with their daily diversity work, right? Um, so how can Exi no, power is kind of an abstract concept. International intersectionality can be very abstract. How can we break it down to uh, trans and employ it to understand how to bring about more environment and equitable environments and outcomes? So in um, our article, this is um, the intersectionality lens. Um, and, and this I adapted from my work on Latinx populations, because as Dr. Dutz said earlier, um, Latinx populations are very nuanced and very complex. Um, and so I adapted that work and saw that it could be perhaps relevant to transformation in geosciences. And so just to kind of walk through this particular figure to represent the level, um, there are three levels. And the first level is on the right, um, sort of the individual level, the, the level of social identities. And there are way more than we could indicate in this depiction of an iris. Um, some of which can overlap, um, but these are just an example. Um, they might blend together, they might overlap, um, they might be intersecting. Together, these identities shape the perspective through which an individual might see or experience the world. Um, and so through what um, we talk about as domains of institutional power, um, and I'll go into those in more detail, but there are four of them. And then more broadly, this must be situated within the histor social historical context, right? Thinking about how a particular place and time are going to also shape um, opportunity structures for, in this case, um, students and faculty and administrators in geosciences seeking to foster equity. So um, I already, in that's, it's already indicated on the prior figure, but just the importance of thinking about identities, but also how they might be salient in various contexts. So um, Dr. Purcell described her research examining um, uh, geosciences classes in labs versus field, right? So, so identities like disability might become very different or in, in terms of their salience in the field versus in the lab, right? Um, and so these are just examples of identities and, uh, that came up in, in the field work that I did. Domains of institutional power. So that was level one, this is level two. Um, examples of organizational uh, domains include earlier academic preparation and schooling, what do students bring with them? And I'll, I will circle back to that, but that's kind of you know, one of the basic ones that we talk about. Representational, um, the images of geoscientists as white, able-bodied men. Earlier, Dr. Cohen talked about, you know, that a lot of times uh, geoscience is depicted as being in the field, right? Like if there's a, a web page for a major, it might show people in the field. Um, so those images can, can actually, you know, foster exclusion. Um, interaction, interactional, we've heard about sexual harassment, emphasis on tough masculinity, um, stereotypes, and those influence how instructors and students and peers interact with each other. Um, and the last one is experiential. And that's how does one perceive, you know, one's agency in all of this, right? Because other research I've done with, you know, K through 12 students, um, they felt like they, um, you know, their, their abilities were l lesser than those of their colleagues. And then when they learned about structural inequalities, about their schooling being less well resourced, they started to realize, wait a minute. And, and so they kind of brought in their perspective and agency. And this is the third level situated in cultural historical context. And so with regard to geoscience, um, it, it began, I mean, a history of natural extraction, right? And, and colonization, um, expansion for land. So 
um, just a lot of taking, a lot of conquest, right, um, and hierarchy. So in terms of knowledge development, historically, science's construction of women and people of color as not human and not capable of intellectual thought. And um, so I just put up here one chapter ledger in Charles Principles of Geology. Um, one of the fundamental pieces in this discipline, which I think speaks for itself, how, how um, you know, views of social identity can't necessarily be historically separated from the science itself. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, the, a couple of examples of taking this lens and thinking about how um, it might be used to transform practice um, to become more inclusive. And so uh, these are two projects that I've been involved in. And um, one of them is uh, a program for undergraduates. Uh, so this is the a GeoPaths program uh, funded by the National Science Foundation that was um, it was operated at a Hispanic serving institution. So those are institutions with 25% or more um, Latinx students. And it was a multiple semester um, program involving rotations in research and industry with local um, employers, but also um, REUs, right? Uh, undergraduate research and uh, it, internships with local employers. It was located in a city with a lot of options for that, um, for, with employers. Um, and so first, um, in terms of thinking about organizational dimensions, one way in which um, this particular program tried to address or transform inclusivity and equity is that it took a talent development perspective, looking for students with potential. So a growth mindset. The students who were selected were not necessarily, the, they weren't, they weren't the um, highest GPA students who often come from, you know, the more affluent backgrounds or, you know, their parents went to college or they were geoscientists. Um, another, in terms of representational, the faculty mentors were from diverse demographic backgrounds. Um, interactional, the, in, these, in this opportunity, employers, this is through our evaluation data and our research data, employers talked about being able to see and perceive students' skills and, and their talents. So that was a really good opportunity for them to interact with students and see what those students had to bring. For the students, they talked about, this is experiential, the opportunity to understand real life applications. And, and in this case, you know, uh, in certain areas of the country or in certain contexts, oil and gas is often dominant um, in terms of the perceptions of geoscience, uh, but these students learned about other industries. And so this broadened their own perception and sense making of educational opportunities. With respect to cultural historical context, this particular program operated in an institution that was historically less well-funded than other institutions in the state because of its high concentration of Latinx population. So it was a history of institutional racial ethnic stratification. A legal case had to happen for that institution to get more resources. So there's a history here, right, where, where that institution was positioned as you know, being less so-called elite or less so-called prestigious than the flagship institution. So the students themselves talked about how interacting with employers and this opportunity made them think that they could compete um, and that they were more likely to apply to graduate school or think about that, um, uh, that they were more likely to apply to graduate school and, and to think about these opportunities um, because they thought they could compete with the flagship. I mean, one dynamic that happens with students who go to less selective institutions, minority serving institutions, they often self select out out of even applying for jobs or applying for graduate school because they think, oh, I can't, you know, I can't compete with that person from that flagship or that very well resourced private school. So, um, so that's one example of thinking about the structural elements and the way of multi dimensionally addressing issues in equity. A second one was um, this audience this time around was faculty. And so Dr. Purcell referred to this uh, program earlier. Um, um, I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of sort of thinking about structural change and organizational change. 
Um, it was a three-day workshop to develop more inclusive and equitable field work. And so the participants, you know, organizationally were pre uh, presented with uh, strategies to restructure field experience, but not just presented. I mean, they had dialogues, right? They shared shared strategies and, and people who had different expertise with different identities. So uh, by the way, in these two slides, when I talk about programs, I'm focusing on levels two and three, the organizational and cultural historical, because a lot of those tend to get um, overlooked or it's harder sometimes to operationalize what those mean. Um, representationally, um, the PIs were from very diverse uh, demographic groups and also the participants. And so they could relate to one another in terms of facing um, challenges and share, um, you know, strategies for uh, managing in the field and managing in the discipline. Um, with regard to interactional, they participated in bystander training. So that was indicated to, I mean, that was intended to address issues of sexual harassment. Uh, and also this idea of just taking responsibility for your peers, taking responsibility for the group. Um, experientially, the um, participants talked about how it gave them an opportunity to think both individually and collectively um, and reflexively about their practice as fieldwork instructors. And then in terms of cultural historical context, um, there was an exercise in which um, a couple of the principal investigators foregrounded the histories of Black and indigenous, indigenous communities in the site that we were on. So the current portrayals in the plaques, you know, on the trails did not include Indigenous and Blacks who also shaped that land. And so to, to really recast what, what is the human history of that site. So um, in, in our article, so those are two kind of concrete examples. Um, and then in our article, we offered um, at level two here of institutional power in these different domains, um, different uh, strategies. And, and we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, about a lot of these, right? Um, you know, increase the quality and quantity of diverse images of geosciences, thinking about uh, K through 12 and higher education partnering together to expose more um, students to images of geoscientists and what it's about, plus the adequate academic skills, reforming introductory classes. Um, we've seen a lot of data on the engagement of diverse geoscientists, but also supportive intergenerational communities of scholars. And, and you know, given and there was a question earlier about how, how to, um, get buy-in when it's mostly junior faculty who are handling this. So the importance of the possibility of finding at least one ally um, who's a senior member of the faculty uh, to partner with, um, to help maybe be a sponsor for these efforts. Um, what I, I heard people talk about as well, and that can be powerful, um, is the power of peer mentoring as well, like sharing cohort mentoring, right? Um, that was discussed earlier as well. Um, and I think part of that is that if, if the system is not going to change tomorrow, then, then people do have, that's sometimes where peers, when there aren't role models in senior positions, where peers can help one another um, while the system is changing and to help the system change. And so this is at the third level, situating within the broader cultural historical context. Um, to articulate the interdependence between geoscientific inquiry and broader social issues. So one of the things we talk about in the article and one of the things that um, an anthropologist of science named Bruno Latour talks about is with the Anthropocene um, era, that's, uh, that can provide you know, a, an opportunity to really talk about how these are intertwined. Um, to recognize the exclusionary history um, in our um, in our article, we talk about the biography of Mar um, Margaret Wilson, um, who was one of the first people to get um, one of the first women in the United States to get a doctorate in geoscience at Columbia University. And, and I, I saw some, some things in the chats, there are horrible stories. Um, and then we just heard um, from, we just heard from Dr. Kelly discussing their biographies. 
experience. And, and so bringing forth, you know, that kind of history is really important, as well as the contributions of diverse scholars. So there's a geoscience student, graduate student here at Ohio State, who is um, reorganizing, um, or she, I think she already has. Great. Uh, so she already has um, reorganized the um, built environment within the department so that it, that it reflects the contributions of diverse geoscientists. So putting images there um, of more diverse scholars who have contributed to the discipline, but might not, might not have been recognized. Um, to incorporate a historical perspective of how indigenous populations and people of color have shaped the land and also the knowledge about and understanding of the land. Also to conduct land acknowledgments in these various settings um, to recognize indigenous history and stewardship of the land. So um, that's where I'm going to end. Uh, I will say that in the presentation, I have a list of references and I am gonna point here. This is um, a website that has um, a, lot, a lot of references and you know, resources and websites related to diversity, equity, and inclusion in geoscience. My two graduate students compiled it in conjunction with um, funding from, the, from this particular grant. So, um, and so, I will just end there. Awesome. Thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, so first up, um, Roy is asking, in my experience, undergraduate, underrepresented, underrepresented minority students are often unaware that grad students generally receive full financial support. Could this be a barrier to application to grad school? Uh, that definitely could be a, a barrier. I mean, in, in terms of even um, just awareness, right, of, of how the financial aid process works. And so I know that there are bridge programs from undergraduate to graduate school that seek to educate undergraduates about those particular opportunities. But certainly, um, those efforts could probably be conducted earlier. And think also about first-generation college-going students who's, uh, who are even less likely to understand how higher education works, let alone financial aid. So um, to opportunities like research undergraduate experiences, those kinds of mentoring opportunities are hopefully spaces as well where, um, where that kind of knowledge can be shared or facilitated as well, right? To find somebody who might write you a little recommendation. Okay, next up. Um, so what are some strategies that predominantly white departments or, and or institutions can employ to create a more inclusive environment for first generation students? And how can faculty proactively engage and support first generation scholars? So I think, first of all, um, what Dr. Dutt was bringing up was just that sometimes when someone's in a privileged position with a particular identity, it's, it's easy to forget what the experiences of others are, um, are like. And so um, for, um, I did see a question in the chat earlier, I think about, you know, the, the cost of field gear. Um, and um, so one of the things, so, so this may, I'm just going to start now because this is one of the things that made me think about. I was um, uh, conducting more field research in a particular department. Um, they, the students initiated a, um, like a lending and they, they initiated kind of a closet where students could contribute and faculty could contribute equipment like water bottles and clothing. And so I was talking to one of the students who who was running it given her leadership role. And she talked about how she said to me, and she herself was first generation and a woman of color. And she said to me, it's so great. I see people wearing my clothes, but they don't know it's my clothes. And so then to make it like anonymous, I think those kinds of collective efforts um, and then to engage the faculty and to engage students, 
I think helped um, others, you know, who might not have had the gear um, to, you know, be able to have access to it. So um, I think that that's one thing to just really understand um, some of the challenges that these particular students face. And are there ways to lend equipment? I'm, now I'm thinking about the field context specifically. Um, are there ways to facilitate um, you know, funding to go to conferences, uh, those kinds of issues. I think um, though being aware, and, I, and this is just my own kind of inter interaction with the culture of geoscience. Um, sometimes I see that a lot of geoscientists are really outdoors people and like skiing and those kinds of sports are really expensive. I mean, and a lot of people don't have money and um, I observed that it means that like first generation students and low income students don't get to sometimes go out and partake in some of those activities. So to really like for faculty, I think to um, educate themselves uh, and learn more and also to get to know their students, I think as well and what their students needs are. Um, is, it, is, it, is it the gear? Is it um, understanding financial aid? One more thing, <laughs> um, when I was doing my field work, I was with um, uh, the only woman of color in that particular group um, from an underrepresented group as defined by NSF, who was working 20 or 30 hours a week. And um, she could never go to seminars. So um, I think there's some opportunities where maybe people could record seminars. Maybe people could consider like rotating different times for seminars. Um, being flexible as to when students can get their lab work done, you know, so there were instructors who talked with me. So particularly for working students, um, I think understanding some of those temp that temporal flexibility um, is really important for these particular students. Awesome. So we have time for one more quick question. Um, so this one is from Marina. Uh, are there ways to help eliminate those biases towards institutions, non-flagship versus flagship or private versus public when reviewing graduate applications? I was just struck that perhaps something as simple as not including the name of a prior institution in an application packet might eliminate that bias. I suspect there would be a lot of pushback on something like that, not to mention that would be hard given letters of recommendation, et cetera. Do you know if there have been any efforts towards something like this? So um, I could, uh, so I, I will talk about this actually. Um, I, so this is not in geoscience. I'm also on a large NSF grant, uh, NSF grant, grant right now about the Computing Alliance of Hispanic Serving Institutions. And so this is a network of over 40 Hispanic serving institutions in the country. Most of them are less well resourced. They are not, you know, so-called brand name institutions, right? So I, um, we organized a workshop um, for the computer, uh, computer information science and engineering directorate exactly a year ago, where we brought together, um, it was about, about 20 um, scholar, computer science scholars from 20 HSIs. And we wrote, I, I think it's just internal within, I guess it's okay for me to talk about it. It's internal within the National Science Foundation. I think to talk about it. I mean, one of the themes that came up was, this question. And so one of, um, one of the things that we talked about um, is that just like there's training on implicit bias, there should be training on implicit institutional bias in review processes. So one of our, so it hasn't necessarily been implemented yet, but one of the things that we've talked about is like how to provide reviewers and program officers at NSF training about how to contextualize these kinds of applications within the realities of what these students at these institutions experience. So that a lot of them might be working, they might not have been able to do undergraduate research experiences. That particular case often excludes people from, you know, applying to graduate school. So how um, I think that finding ways of training and raising awareness um, and maybe doing set aside, you know, it may be that in some cases set asides uh, for minority serving institutions um, could also be helpful um, while we're all trying to, you know, combat individual and institutional bias. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Nunez. We look forward to including you in our Q&A panel shortly. Um, so we have one last presentation today. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Christy Visacci, uh, who is the Senior Lecturer and Undergraduate Director in the Department of Geosciences at Georgia State University to present her presentation on teaching geology and paleontology for all identities. Feel free to share your screen and take it away. Okay. All right, does that look all right? Yes, it looks great. Okay. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. I am Christy Visaji at Georgia State University, and I will be focusing on teaching for all identities. So I like to begin usually with talking about the diversity crisis as a concept. And paleontologists, I think, have long thought about diversity uh, and its importance and how it's a crisis that now we are in what some call the sixth extinction with the rapid loss of species due to human impacts. But we haven't really collectively looked inward at the diversity crisis within our own discipline. And as other speakers have shared today, we haven't really seen progress on diversity for 40 years, as evidenced by the Bernard and Cooper doc paper, as well as several other studies or reports by different organizations or co-authors that have looked at patterns of gender or Hispanic students or other people of color, those with disabilities. And when we look at our society, the kinds of representation we see in identities in society, that is not reflected in geosciences. And as many of you know, geosciences is the weakest uh, of STEM fields when we look at the lack of representation of these different groups. Why should we care about diversity? I think this is an important thing to talk about because if you're trying to affect change and you want others to uh, join the movement with you, it's important that they understand why we should value diversity. As scientists, we may value the concept again when we talk about ecology and evolution, but there are many ways in which the research shows that diversity is important to science. It advances scientific progress. We come in with different perspectives, different experiences. Of course, there's the issue of environmental justice and a lot of the complex issues that geoscientists are working to address disproportionately affect those that are lower socioeconomic standing or those with um, from different racial or ethnic groups. The public perception and value of science is not always uh, as strong as it should be and valued. And so I think one of the things we can do, again, is to do a better job of trying to reach all identities and have uh, a better way of connecting those individuals and how their lives are very much linked to science. And diversity is the future. In an increasingly global society where people have um, many different identities, we just heard about intersectional identities, and so this is something that in geosciences we really need to work on. So I'll just share a few um, presentations or publications. One recent one that talks about the diversity innovation paradox, where this is again evidence for why diversity is so important and having uh, those from different backgrounds can really help think about science in new ways. And then I also like to get into obstacles why I am not going to focus too much on that as other speakers have today. There are, sorry, I'm uh, thrown off because a, a slide seems to be missing from my presentation. <laughs> okay, so I'll just talk about the obstacles since they're not showing up. Um, so many different obstacles that various authors, Stokes et al, he spoke earlier today on barriers, perceptions to the major, uh, also, of course, racism, you heard from Kuheli Dutt earlier in this session, and uh, thinking about other challenges that 
different uh, identities may face, such as hostile climates. There was a publication out about that recently as well. So moving from obstacles to opportunities, there has been increasing interest in part due to the widespread protests following police brutality and the wrongful deaths of black and brown people that has been long ongoing, but has uh, sparked more widespread interest in recent months during the pandemic, where now people are listening, are talking more, and I hope are ready to act more in support of those from marginalized and oppressed groups. There are petitions to uh, improve the challenges of racism in geosciences, and there's increasing publications as to how we can think about uh, the issues related to DEI in geosciences. What I'd like to talk specifically about today is that of instruction. And I am in a teaching position here at Georgia State University. And last week, finally, uh, a publication came out on equity, culture, and place in teaching paleontology. And this is a student-centered approach for broadening participation. It is available through Cambridge Press. It is one of the elements uh, free to download through Tuesday, August 11th. So much of what I'll be sharing today comes in part from that publication. There's my obstacle slide. Well, I somehow got those reversed and there you go to see the examples that I shared with you. Okay. The main focus is culturally responsive pedagogy. And this is an umbrella term. Uh, there are different authors who have defined how they view culturally responsive pedagogy or other variations of this term. And all of the approaches have similarities. They value students as individuals. There's an engaging practice that fosters community. We try to provide meaningful connections to students and draw on intrinsic motivation. It's been shown to improve recruitment and retention of underrepresented groups. It's supported by neuroscience and ultimately even if you're implementing it as a way to try to improve the experience for underrepresented groups, it's ultimately beneficial for all students. If we're focused on trying to improve diversity in our discipline, the first thing we need to do is recognize that identities are intersectional. And so are we being inclusive and welcoming? Do they feel like they belong? What can we do to ensure that they are having the resources that they need and that our practices in our classroom are equitable so that all students can succeed. And so all of these concepts combined, I think, fall nicely into thinking about instruction as culturally responsive using this concept of culture broadly defined. While I'm focusing more on uh, race and ethnicity in this presentation, those uh, Concepts of culture also relate to being in an urban setting or generational or disabilities or LGBTQ. So culture, that kind of shared norms, beliefs, experiences, that is how I'm focusing on it here. To begin, I'd like to say that it is not simply a checklist of approaches and you can go out and add these examples to your instruction and check, you're done. It's much more than that. It also doesn't simply look cultural. There are aspects of uh, culturally responsive pedagogy that don't even consider or include specific examples or references to race or ethnicity or other aspects of identity. It's not simply inserting culture into education, but teaching in the context of culture. So being much more aware of culture and how you set up what you do. Also, it goes beyond instruction. Pedagogy includes much more than what your actual teaching or lecturing is. It incorporates knowledge of resource limitations of your students, avoiding stereotypes or isolating identities, using multiple modes of evaluation. There's not a one size fits all approach. And of course, having respectful communication and not using classist or ableist or racist or other language that would be culturally offensive. Ultimately, it's a shift in mindset and in your practice as an educator. How I view it is through three main lenses. One is students as individuals, 
getting to know your students, giving them ownership and learning, thinking about attendance and participation and knowing that for some, those policies can be very exclusionary. Same with rigid deadlines. Not everyone is working with the same availability to put into their schoolwork. Some have outside jobs, some have families to take care of. Life happens, as we all know, in the midst of this pandemic. So there's ways that we can approach what we do in the classroom that creates more opportunities for success for students. Also ideas of differentiated instruction, as well as universal design in meeting needs of everyone. I use this photo of my brother here at the top. He is a wheelchair user and he uh, has accompanied me into the field for uh, fossil collection. So field work is one of those things that we really need to take a hard look at in geosciences and was talked about earlier today. Some view the discipline as one that you have to do field work, which is not helpful. Some think that uh, you can't to do field work if you have a certain disability. And what we're seeing, hopefully, is that people are examining the culture of field work, the barriers to doing field work, and that geosciences is not just about field work. So we can show that geosciences is more than just a white, able bodied, male, rugged individual uh, hiking through high mountains. Another example with students as individuals is an assignment I do in intro classes to look at geology around the world. They synthesize their knowledge of concepts in geology, as well as get to explore places of interest and meaning to them. And so I give them choice in this. And as evidenced by the map here, you can see that the students pursue many different places to really understand the links between what they're learning in geology, how geology is important for society, and then how it relates to interest in their lives. Engaging practices is the second lens. Um, this is about building community and having students work together. So you can do small groups learning, you can gamify lessons. Telling stories is a very human thing to do to make sense of the world. Incorporating that into your learning is a really valuable way for people to learn. Uh, and of course, linking to real world problems. So something when you teach minerals, instead of just focusing on identifying them and doing properties to check for hardness and cleavage, you can talk more broadly about how we use those minerals in our daily lives. You know, everyone appreciates their cell phone and how much access they have. Do they know what minerals go into making that device? Do they know where those come from in the world? And then what challenges there are in terms of mining and ethical issues and injustices related to that. Another example I use in my classes is a, a fun card game developed by a former student of mine where you have small groups of students organize different cards that represent events in the history of life to try to make a sense of the order and sequence of those events in Earth history. This was also really useful to adapt to virtual learning. We created a model of this to use in a drag and drop uh, PowerPoint slide way. And then students have to think about what makes sense, why you need to have certain things present on earth before you can have other events uh, later on. One resource I'd like to share with you that is coming soon. So check the Paleontolog uh, Paleontological Society website. Uh, there are fossil use cards that uh, several colleagues and I are developing where teachers can print these cards to have students mix and match and look at examples of fossils that are used in interesting ways, whether that's scientific, uh, more personal or cultural or industrial. The theme this week for Earth Science Week is materials in our lives, which is why we focused on this uh, particular activity. So know that is coming soon. And anyone interested in this, please uh, reach out to me. I have other projects in the work that I hopefully will be able to share with you about in the future. The items featured here show about crinoids and how they've been used as beads by different uh, groups, including Native Americans, as well as petrified wood in Arizona that has been used as building material for Pueblos. And lastly, bridging connections is the third lens where you use uh, relevant quotes, metaphors, vocabulary, language, 
uh, guest speakers and inspiring role models, uh, positive appropriate media, and familiar and interesting places. So I first became interested in uh, this approach, culturally responsive pedagogy, at a uh, CERC workshop on Pan-African approaches to teaching geosciences at Morehouse uh, several years ago. And I learned of the tenets of Pan-Africanism as the focus of that workshop was to do more in our instruction to reach uh, those who are Black or African-American. And the concept of Sankofa is one of those tenets of Pan-Africanism, which essentially means to go back to the past, take what is useful, and bring it to you to the future. And when I heard that, I thought that is conservation paleobiology. That's almost the same words used in this paper here to describe what that idea is. And then in thinking about conservation and the Anthropocene and human impacts, we have to also consider that the lens that we may have as scientists or the lens that a white privileged individual may have about that is not going to be the same as those from marginalized and oppressed groups. And so I encourage you to look at the A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None book to learn more about the complexities of that. Scientist spotlight interventions have been shown to be very useful in teaching science. I've put a selection of individuals here who are very important not only for their scientific contributions in geosciences, but also in being a member of an underrepresented group. So if you're not familiar with these individuals and you're not using them in your classes when you talk about different concepts, I encourage you to look into that. In addition, I'm placing here several places where you can learn more about either historical figures or um, modern individuals that are belonging to um, members of uh, diverse groups. Other ways to bridge connections in paleontology, there is definitely a history where uh, Fossils have been removed from land that was not owned by the people that removed them. And one of the ways that we can explore this more is by just thinking about whose native land are you on? And there's an interactive map where you can look at that and think, okay, the places I'm using to teach about fossils or the examples I'm bringing into my classroom, what peoples are the um, Native American groups coming from these lands. And there's also work by uh, Adrian Mayer about this as well. When you talk about climate change, are you bringing in the issues that it creates for indigenous communities around the world? Or in speaking about famous volcanic landmarks like Mount St. Helens, giving recognition to the fact that there is a history and multiple names for this location by different tribal groups in the area? Or how uh, slavery has led to the discovery of fossils as well as uh, the movement of fossiliferous building stone to different places in the country. The state fossil of South Carolina was originally found by an enslaved individual and uh, buildings including the Smithsonian have a history related to slavery. Here I provide a selection of resources that explore more of these concepts in bridging connections, whether you're looking at building stones, uh, looking at fossil appropriation, thinking about the cultural significance of species, or uh, people from underrepresented groups who have made significant contributions to the discipline. Also, of course, articles in the Journal of Geoscience Education. There are some wonderful examples in there of uh, cultural connections related to learning about geosciences. And then lastly, I would like to mention place-based learning. I know I'm just about out of time, so I'll go quickly. I'm at Minority Serving Institution, Georgia State University in downtown Atlanta, and I teach multiple classes, and Georgia has a great history, as you heard from our sp first speaker today. Place-based learning falls under the umbrella of culturally responsive pedagogy, drawing on that sense of place, there's um, a familiar knowledge and meaning to learning about places around you. And since students at my institution come overwhelmingly from Georgia, it's a fantastic way to have students connect to their learning in a more meaningful way. 
One example I've done is get historical photos of campus buildings. So they start to think about relative age dating by organizing photos from oldest to youngest in uh, looking for historical clues and before they have to face a challenging cross section. Also, when looking at resources in Georgia, such as gold mining, being sure to mention the Trail of Tears and the removal of the Cherokees related to that, as well as referencing the large granite stone mountain that is a wonderful geological feature with a very troubling history of uh, white supremacy and you know choosing instead to not ignore that but use photos such as this to incorporate more anti-racism work into instruction. So the last few slides are mostly sharing of resources. There are multiple places where you can learn more about colonialism and geology, how to make your virtual learning more inclusive. And I just want to remind everybody again, you know, think about how we view earth system approaches as really valuable to understanding our planet. Same with broadening participation. Multiple approaches need to happen. It's not just a change one thing. It's the intersection of many different strategies and ultimately uh, being better at supporting students of all identities. If you're not familiar with these wonderful organizations, these show how students from many different backgrounds are uh, represented and supported in science and geoscience broadly. And so lastly, I encourage you to challenge yourself uh, do difficult work like taking the implicit bias test to see what biases you bring into the classroom as an instructor. Work to improve your allyship, make it visible, and don't just make it visible, but actually do the work. As our speaker earlier today said, what are you actually doing to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion? Think about your classroom approaches, both your syllabus, do you have a statement? Do you have uh, resources there for first generation students and those with disabilities? There are multiple ways that you can think, is your instruction for all identities accessible, engaging, and meaningful? And with that, I will leave you with a quote from Rosalind Franklin, who if you didn't know, has made substantial contributions to geosciences as well as uh, not just being known for the wronged heroine in understanding DNA. And she stated that science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. And so I urge you, if you are teaching in a way that is focusing on the science content only, please think more broadly in the context of culture, what you can do. Thank you so much again for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, the Paleontological Research Institution uh, many colleagues at the Paleontological Society and Georgia State University who have supported me and contributed to my understanding, of course, the workshop where I initially took an interest in this. My two best field assistants, uh, whether <laughs> sharing a presentation with me or uh, in the fields. Parents, I see you right now in this pandemic. It is hard. Uh, mamas, those who identify as mamas, it's especially hard. So uh, we are here with you and many of us are ready to do what we can to support you. And lastly, there again is a reminder about my publication. If you want to learn more about these teaching approaches, which is available for free to download until August 11th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fasachi. Um, so one question for you before I bring back the rest of our panelists. Uh, so these are some really great resources. Uh, do we have information on how the conversation on inclusion and diversity among geoscientists has benefited from the increasing number of large scale studies on the subject? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, I think that while there have been publications, you know, even over a decade ago and there were minority committees decades ago. The widespread sharing of these publications on social media, including popular press coverage, um, particularly uh, Kuhaley Dutt's uh, article recently, 
on uh, racism and the publication uh, in the New York Times about how earth science has a whiteness problem. Yes, I think absolutely. Just the more people that are sharing these uh, stories on various outlets that has, I think, I hope, led to a, a new movement where more and more people are, are buying in and thinking about what they can do differently to affect change. Thank you so, so much. Um, at this time, I would like to invite our other two speakers today who are, were present for session three and we will open up the live Q&A portion of our session. So first question for you all, do you have any advice for encouraging institutional leaders to take ownership and action? In my department, most of the work is already falling on students and junior faculty. I guess I'll, I'll share a little first. If, so they said students and junior faculty. I think I would, I would reiterate what, uh, Haley said earlier today, or I think it was her who found, um, who said that, you know, finding those allies in other leadership positions uh, as well. So not just junior faculty, but whether it's in another department, um, in a certain campus resource center, but uh, finding others who can be allies to be able to put more energy into spreading that work out and spreading that message out to more in in the department and not having it just solely be those junior faculty or, or students. I hesitate because I'm not in a geosciences department, but um, uh, I will say that sometimes also um, if some of these professional alliances and associations and communities can also be sort of uh, nationwide communities of practice that um, you know different departments and institutional leaders might be able to link across uh, institutions um, to get gather resources to be able to make change and so in other research on stem initiatives these kind of interinstitutional um, efforts can build capacity and sometimes when funding's involved like an NSF grant that can also um, lead to buy-in um, leaders um, can see more like the value of that um, for better or for worse sometimes that kind of prestige um, can really really help in these kinds of situations um, so those are just some potential other avenues yeah I mean I'd just like to reiterate that for the junior, like the students, postdocs, junior faculty, you know, find allies in the mid-career to senior faculty and have them reach out to the leadership and, you know, request a meeting or a conversation with all of them. Make it clear it will be the start of a dialogue and not just a one-off meeting. So, you know, it, just to start a process rather than a one-time thing. I think that's really important because sometimes um, mid-career and senior faculty, they might not be aware um, but might be willing to support you. And so if you, it, even though it might be challenging to take initiative with those that you feel comfortable with, who maybe in that closed door meeting that you're not part of, can say something on behalf, you know, on behalf of you or behalf of your colleagues, um, I think would be really important. And then I think also, I mean, in my own experience, not in geoscience, but as, as an education faculty member, I created a peer mentor and faculty network with other Latinx faculty. There were like no Latina faculty who were at a senior level in my prior department, but we came together and we applied for internal grants together. And so then that kind of gets the attention, I think, of senior faculty. And we, it, we involve senior faculty in mentoring our group, um, who we call comadres. Um, so I think that there are these kind of intergenerational and peer uh, at the same time potential to uh, address change. I would add also that sometimes different talking points can reach different people better. So, you know, some of the things when, when having conversations with those in the, the mid or senior level, reminding them that in trying to encourage others to get on board that, you know, NSF and other funding agencies are taking uh, DEI work very seriously. You know, this is not something that can be brushed aside any longer. And in order to stay relevant, 
in uh, the climate that we're in now, it's, it's really important that people are uh, not leaving it for somebody else to do and that everybody is contributing. Definitely. Um, so our next question is, as part of our department's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, I'm working with our Center for Teaching and Learning to develop a one to two hour TA workshop on DEI for each semester for our geoscience TAs. Last semester, I focused on building inclusive labs and discussion groups. Do you have one to two questions, one to two suggestions for building future workshops around? And this was from Mary. I could start. Uh, I would, well, what, one of the things I've been noticing of late that has suddenly gone up in a lot of demand uh, is that students, postdocs, a lot of them nowadays, right now, I think, are demanding courses and workshops on systemic racism and anti-racism. So if you could work with, you know, your Center for Teaching and Learning to develop a module or a workshop on systemic racism, and then make sure it's not just students, but the faculty who also end up attending it. That would be a great way to get have impact. It could be that um, engaging social science faculty or faculty from ethnic studies who can also bring in that knowledge um, within the institution could be really helpful. Um, you know, one of the things I think about in DEI work is, well, they can't necessarily read everything that, <laughs> that we're reading, but, but how can we draw on the expertise maybe of other people around campus and then think about how do we make connections with our science? And I, I don't know if, Mary, you have done this at your institution, but uh, having TAs do individual reflection as well as group uh, sharing of different aspects of identity and the kinds of things where, you know, if you look up identity wheels, there's different ways that people think about your social identity or other aspects of your identity and how you are coming into the classroom and how students are perceiving you uh, as the instructor because you are a woman or because you are a person of color. Uh, thinking about those kinds of things and discussing ways that if there are challenges, you can try to think about that in advance has been a useful part of the teaching practicum that we've done here at Georgia State. Another thing I might add is that, you know, I, I know I talked about maybe partnering with faculty in other departments, but also perhaps thinking about student affairs. Um, a lot of the um, faculty, I mean, a lot of the sort of administrators and staff in student affairs are trained in issues like dialogue if they're in a multicultural center. So they might be able to help um, build skills in issues like communication and in skills like dialogue. And so I mentioned that because it might be like low hanging fruit. There may be, you know, people in student affairs or women's studies um, uh, or like the women's center or multicultural affairs that also might have these um, particular skills a different way of connecting. Awesome, thank you. Our next question is from Alicia. For me, the decision not to pursue a PhD was strictly financial. Grants and scholarships for women still seem to be lacking. Does anyone have any advice for minorities that want to further their education but just can't finance it? I, I can suggest that one of the, and this is something not so much from the student end, but from the institutional ownership end, where departments and institutions should actually commit to setting funding aside for minority students. And that's something that doesn't necessarily um, factor in as much because financial considerations are significantly high, especially for first generation students. And if, if you feel you know, brave enough, I would suggest you know, having students get together and request the departments that you know, what sort of funding can you provide students for whom funding is an issue. It's important for um, departments to also think about um, cobbling together potentially different sources of funding. Um, that uh, there might be funding for, at the university level, also at the department level, also at the grant level. So how can 
how can um, departments put together um, you know, multi-year packages, right, that might come from different sources. Um, I, in terms of not knowing whether or not one can afford it, sometimes it's hard, like, sometimes it's hard to know until you actually get your package, um, whether or not you can actually, um, you know, pursue uh, an education. I know that in, you know, in my department, we really prioritize like being able to give students complete packages. So I, again, that's like Kelly was saying, it's not necessarily from the student level, but um, to realize that maybe if you're applying, there may be multiple sources of funding that you might not have um, thought about. I also wanted to add to uh, really make sure that you're connecting with relevant organizations like SACNAS or other groups, um, depending on, you know, whatever identity, uh, identities you are uh, connected to, because there are, you know, certain scholarships, there's the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, there are Ford Foundation Fellowships, you know, there are different uh, scholarships to support either broadly diversity in academia or uh, certain uh, individuals. And so connecting with those organizations or, uh, you know, Facebook groups or people who are a little farther along in their career path and have knowledge about those resources, who have been recipients of those scholarships, such as NSF GRFP, uh, those can be great places to also learn about some of those opportunities as well to continue your education. Some of the, yeah, and I think that, um... If there's a way you might be able to find out that certain departments are really good at mentoring students to apply for GRFPs, like some departments have like really good mentoring programs. And so there may be opportunities once you get there, but sometimes that can be hard information to get it if you're at the application stage. But um, perhaps if you have informal networks to find out about some of that, you know, informal knowledge around accessing funding that um, you might not have known existed, you know, these kinds of uh, mentoring opportunities within the department. And I just remembered also the AGU Bridge Program. And while it is not specific to funding, it is a group of institutions that are committed to uh, recruiting more students from diverse backgrounds. And so that might be something to look into as well. Awesome, thank you all. Um, our next question uh, is, whilst we encourage folks from overrepresented groups to educate themselves on DEI issues and to not let the work fall on those from underrepresented groups, when underrepresented groups are consulted on issues as part of the changing the internal culture process, it gets really confusing to know where the midpoint is between helping to refine a policy and doing the work for someone on a DEI committee who hasn't done their homework. How do you know if you're being taken advantage of and where is the midpoint? This is actually something that I've encountered a lot in, as in, in terms of people have asked me about the, this particular issue a lot because very often DEI work falls on people of color and marginalized groups. I would say that I know as the first point of contact Yes, you know, your department or your advisor or your colleagues would turn to you. And what I would suggest, rather than just, you know, saying no or taking it on to the point where you're just, you know, doing all of the work, say, yes, I'm happy to do it. Who are the people who are going to work with me on this? Making it very clear that the people who are going to work with you on it need to be white people. Like, that's probably the first step. And I would suggest be very firm on that point. If they say, oh, well, we don't really know. Why don't you do it? And then we'll see who we come up with, you know, then say that doesn't really send a message or make it clear that that's not the message you want and that while you're happy to start this conversation and, you know, help people how to do it, unless there's commitment from other white people at that very moment who will work with you on it, it's not something you're comfortable doing. I think um, faculty of color and women faculty are um, expected, you know, to do more service um, in general like this. And so this is, you know, part of also just learning how to say no or not, I'm not saying no totally, but 
you might say, um, how, how long of a time commitment is this? Like the way that you might about any service commitment. What kinds of tasks are involved um, to indicate that, you know, you have boundaries around which, you know, you're not going to work past those particular boundaries. Or maybe um, you say if somebody approaches you and you have another mentor at your institution, you might say, I have, I need um, a day or two to think about this. I need to talk with my mentor and talk with your mentor. And maybe that way you might learn about politics. You might learn some knowledge that you might not have been aware of. And that might help you in terms of discussing like, to what extent you want to commit and what you want to commit to. And if you get into it and it's like expanding to say, re remember, I said I would do this and I need to walk away and, and protect yourself. I would also add that uh, I think a lot of times on committees or people who maybe are passionate about DEI issues, we also need to remember there are people who are paid in paid positions through organizations who have developed some of these resources. So depending on what the work is, if it's developing a resource or a module or you know, speaking about a certain subject, it might be something where uh, someone is doing this as part of their job and you can bring that person in or use that uh, training online or something like that and, and take the work off of yourself. Along these same lines, we have a similar question. Um, so across many departments, um, graduate students and also emerging professionals are often expected to do unpaid labor, um, uh, including internships or unwritten expectations for department service, et cetera. How does this impact inclusivity and equity? And what are some strategies, especially for students and others in more precarious positions advocate against this aspect of professional culture? That is a good question and very difficult to answer, <laughs> I think. Um, I'll just mention one example that we have tried to use here. And that is at Georgia State, there's an opportunity to apply for certain special funding for student organizations and events and you know there's tech fees and sustainability fees and so one thing we did was to create a scholarship program or a fellowship program for students who are doing internships in sustainability so that if it was a non-paid internship or volunteering that they could apply to this fellowship specifically to try to support them in that so it was one way internally in our department that we tried to do it, but also across the university, there are other ways to try to support students to do things like internships because they shouldn't have to do, you know, unpaid internships. That's just going to further create inequities for only those who have the privilege to be able to pursue them can do them. Uh, so at least in terms of that aspect of the question, there might be some resources at the institution that could help support students in that way. I think, you know, and I think um, what Christy's bringing up is just the importance of asking the question. A lot of times um, students might not be aware of what resources there are available to them. And if you ask the question, that might raise awareness. Oh, wait a minute. Like, this is something our institution should probably be thinking about. Um, yet sometimes, again, like faculty and administrators are need reminding um, that w when these issues come up to think about or you know say like are there resources available for this to remind them that this is actually work and this is labor time. I know from the perspective of being a faculty of color that with my graduate students they get asked um, to do uh, they, they get asked sometimes to be on university-wide diversity committees or I'm I'm asked if I know anybody, right, to recommend people. And so as a faculty member, I try to be really clear with them, like, you, uh, this is an opportunity, but you can say no, and, and that's okay. And this is, this is, the, this is kind of the um, strengths of potentially doing this, but you absolutely don't have to do it. Um, and so to kind of teach people, like, how to, um, or mentor in, in how to set boundaries and not expect you know, not have graduate students expect that when they're called on 
that they, um, you know, uh, should respond to, to requests. And, and maybe there are times when students could say, I need to ask my advisor, I need to talk with my advisor. And, and to make that advisor, you know, be your sponsor or be that kind of in-between person who might be able to talk with others about, you know, protecting students from that kind of emotional or other unpaid labor. And one of the ways to do that in trying to have your advisor help protect you or, or others when they ask you these things, you know, if you can say, well, I need to talk with my advisor about what else I can drop or not do if I'm going to potentially take on this new thing, right? So you have to also think you, there are only so many things you can do. So every time you get a new request, you know, consult with your advisor or think to yourself both, right? If you're going to also try to do this, what else is going to have to go or be put um, aside? And then ultimately, you know, ensuring that you and your advisor have the same vision for what the main priority for your goals and your time and your energy should be. Awesome. I recently experienced just that, so <laughs> um, this is good information. Um, it looks like we have a follow-up um, on that question. Um, so what are your thoughts on the role of program staff uh, in this conversation? Um, I, I think, you know, there's some research that, um, that I've been doing and some of my colleagues have been doing about the important role of staff in terms of bridging some of these um, concerns. And sometimes, you know, that, that staff can take, uh, that they can also be people who can relay concerns to faculty, who can relay concerns to administrators, who can be, um, for lack of a better word, safe or comfortable people for students to approach. Um, and I think st uh, particularly like program staff who might be involved in a DEI program, or if they know that that's, even if they're regular full-time staff and they know that that's part of their responsibility, um, they might expect those kinds of questions. Uh, and they might know that it's part of their responsibility to support students in navigating that. So I think, I think the question of staff is really important. And I mean, one of the things that I've noticed in my research on um, geoscience and computer science is there's a lot of talk about faculty diversity, but at the tenured level, um, a lot of times there might not be any faculty of color or only one. And so this idea of relating across <laughs> identities um, can be really challenging. And so sometimes uh, staff can be a really important bridge for advocating for raising awareness among those faculty, the concerns of first generation students, of students of color. So I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that staff is, as was also brought up. Looks like um, we also had one more specific note on that. Um, so non-academic staff in an academic program, um, there is usually focus on students as future academics or on academics. Staff are often left out of the conversation despite providing con continuity for academic departments and tending to remain in roles long after students have graduated or when new cohorts of faculty start. I'm not sure, like, um, it, so I am not sure if what the conversation that's being referred to is um, mentoring students for future um, positions, um, but I think that. Um, for, I mean, I think it's important for faculty and staff um, to, to really think about what are non-academic options for students, to, to model that, that multiple career pathways are um, valid. Um, you know, there are um, STEM PhDs who go on to serve as administrators in my, in my institution, um, supporting all the postdocs at, at across the university um, to be, aware that there are just multiple pathways and that all of those are valid. I know that not all faculty like think that way, but um, in my own practice and experience, um, I think it's really important if we're supposed to provide opportunities for students to make sure that students are aware of the full set of opportunities available to them in terms of opportunity structures. And if we don't know, to maybe be able to refer them to 
the association that might know um, to a professional network that might know. I'm not sure if that was your question, but I think it's um, important. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so next question, uh, we only have time uh, for one, maybe two more questions. Um, do you think each department should be required to post admission and race ethnicity statistics as well as having a DEI director? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes to both questions. In fact, at Lamont, we do exactly that. So um, in fact, in the, in the chat box, I can probably post what we do. So what we do is not just post the demographics of our, um, of our scientific staff, but also who are the people we're inviting for seminars and what does that look like? So, you know, having this, having this out there very publicly so that people can see it, look at the numbers, you know, whether there's been any change or what those numbers look like, it introduces a level of transparency and also introduces accountability. Like if those numbers are public, you know, you have to do something about improving them. Uh, I also think it's really important to have someone, a diversity director of sorts, look at, you know, for every institution. I serve as a diversity director for Lamont. And I think maybe that's why we've been able to do as much as we have, because otherwise, at the end of the day, students, faculty, postdocs, they're there to do their science, to teach their classes. And so if they have to devote a significant amount of their time to DEI work, and that's not acknowledged or compensated in some form, either it's going to create a hole in their CV at the time that they're doing this. In other words, it's going to take away from other things. Or it's not really going to help any form of institutional ownership because that person, if it's a student or a postdoc, will just move on to another institution in a few years time. And the institution isn't, the current institution isn't going to really benefit from it one way or the other. So I think it's really important to have someone designated and of course it would depend on the structure of the organization so for Lamont it's you know the campus is big enough that we have a diversity you know I am the diversity director but in other departments it could be even a you know even if it's a 50 percent position or even if it's just someone designated as the go-to person who's going to be charged with this thing of you know even if not doing the work themselves who do you reach out to who do you enroll who do you enlist who's you know, how many meetings per semester do you have? Who's keeping track of what got done and didn't get done and why or why not? So just having some sort of institutional framework, even asking these questions, it's important to have someone for that institutional memory. All right, and before we wrap up, I just wanted to make sure if any of you had a question for each other um, or based on each other's presentations, give you an opportunity to ask those. I think your presentations were great. <laughs> likewise. <laughs> ah, likewise. I, I appreciate how um, they all complemented one another and looking at a lot of different levels of, um, you know, intervention, I think is really important. And then I uh, just have one last question for you all. Um, so now that uh, we are seeing so much unrest in our society and we're starting to really uh, elevate these ideas and break down some of these boundaries um, across race, gender, and identity, what is one piece of advice, um, something small that any of us can do to be a good ally um, in both geoscience and paleo? I would say each person needs to do their homework and not expect it to be the duty of a person of color to bear the brunt of DEI work, to explain to white people what racism is or why it's harmful. To, yeah, to just, to just take ownership of the problem and, you know, and everything that comes with it. I think in a related vein, to, to just be willing to speak up when like a microaggression happens, uh, to be willing to take ownership and call people out. At the same time, I think depending on your context and depending on your role, there may be different things that you are, you know, that you are doing um, in addition to that. So um, sometimes uh, 
I, you know, in my own work, I might be doing things that are not very visible to other people, but um, I know that, like, I'm, I'm now at decision-making tables. And so in my role, it's lifting up um, scholars of color, it's making clear what their contributions are, and so maybe from a student perspective, it's also, you know, supporting your peers, making clear what the, their contributions are. I know academia um, is a competitive environment. Um, if there's a way to um, collaborate and, and just promote one another, um, I think that that would also be look out for one another. And kind of related to those, you know, really listening, listen to people of color, listen to those from marginalized and oppressed groups, uh, really, you know, critically self-reflect and, and check yourself because until you listen, until you read, until you really start to understand these other positionalities, you know, you're, you're only coming to it from your lens and you don't necessarily know what you're doing that impacts other people in a negative way. And so just, it's, it's all part of doing your homework and, and <laughs> stepping in so they're all related. It's hard to just say one thing. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all so, so much for an awesome Q&A panel discussion. Um, so with that, um, the PRI Summer Symposium is finally coming to a close. Um, we'd like to extend a true heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers and organizers. This was a 100% volunteer <laughs> run effort. Um, so for everyone for donating their time, um, to create such an open space for discussion um, in making this event such a success. Um, a few reminders, um, if you have not already done so, please um, check out our speaker nominated funds and organizations to donate to if you are able. Uh, we will be putting together resources that have been shared throughout all sessions today, uh, so they will be available at a later time as well as recordings of sessions will be available and we will be able to email our attendees and promote those on social media when they become available. Um, and lastly, please um, look at our uh, feedback survey. We truly ap appreciate any and all feedback and comments that you have for our event today as we hopefully look forward to uh, incorporating more virtual events in the future. Um, you can find all of this information on our website. There are links currently in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for joining us.